So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, today, we'll be talking about how we, you know, the work we're doing in order to bring AI uh, to the edge by using uh, WebAssembly and Onyx. And before starting, my name is Francisco Cabrera. Uh, I'm a technical program manager at the Azure Edge and Platform team. Uh, for the past couple of years, I've been working on Kubernetes, uh, Linux, and since I met Ralph, WebAssembly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Ralph Gulacci. I'm a program manager in the Azure Core Upstream team. Um, and uh, so we're going to kick off with uh, Francisco for a while, and then I'll come in and talk a little bit at the end. So before starting talking about you know, a bit of the technology and the work we did, let's start by talking about what are the kind of customer use cases that we're seeing for Edge AI. And you know, at, at, at the Azure Edge and Platform team, and specifically working on, on Kubernetes on the Edge, we're seeing a lot of kind of different use cases for this AI on the edge. And, and because the edge is, you know, every time we talk about the edge, it's just like so big and it feels like everything that is not in the cloud now, it's, it's the edge. So we, we kind of try to divide this edge in these different buckets, right? And the first bucket that we talked about is the, what we call the highly distributed edge. And here it's just like we're talking about more the PC class hardware devices. We're talking more about like sensors. We're talking about actuators. Do you know this? They're running really like four GB, right, small devices. Um, and we can see these devices, for example, in industrial scenarios. So for industrial scenarios, we're seeing demos where, for example, they're, using, they're doing welding detection to actually determine if a welding is correct or not. And based on that, actually do you know, have like, human interaction there to, to determine you know, what happened with that welding. Uh, we're seeing use cases, for example, to actually use data analysis, like for predictive uh, kind of maintenance. Um, or we're also you know, seeing a lot of kind of visual AI to actually determine if somebody can just go through a specific zone or not, and based on that, actually you know, you know, create an alarm. Um, we do have also customers, for example, in the kind of medical vertical. Uh, there we're seeing also a, a lot of kind of vision AI, uh, you know, using kind of these algorithms in order to help uh, doctors with you know, diagnosis. And then finally, a lot of retail. So in retail, we're seeing use cases, for example, where people are using these kind of AI and models to actually determine customer patterns. So, so you know, in these retail shops, how, how are you moving around? How is the customers moving around? How are they interacting with the different products? Um, and also, you know, like uh, we're now working, for example, with some food chain restaurants, right, where you actually can use uh, Edge AI to take the order, for example, right, use you know, Gen AI to actually take the order and then prepare the order and have another kind of AI algorithm to do vision AI and determine if that order was prepared correctly if, you know, by the human. Uh, you don't want to arrive home and have the wrong burger. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty important that. Um, and then... The second kind of part of you know, the edge we have is just you know, what we call more you know, the on-prem edge, you know, the big edge. And here we have you know, the customer data centers, the CDNs. So customer data centers, we're seeing a lot of kind of, uh, for example, industrial scenarios with these kind of specific you know, chat GPTs kind of um, trained for, let's say, industrial uh, kind of scenarios where you could just you know, train your model with a specific guide on you know, how to use a machine. And you know, if you're an operator of that kind of floor plan, you just go ahead there, you, tell, you, know, you ask the question, why I get this blue kind of LED blinking on my machine and just use it for that. CDNs, a lot of kind of, you know, like, um, you know, WebAssembly is there running out to, you know, really fast. Uh, and, you know, those functions that right now, uh, maybe they could also get, right, Edge AI as part of those functions. And then finally, if you think about it, almost every computer right now uh, with, you know, with the whole Copilot, you have the Office Copilot, we have the GitHub Copilot there also. It's just running uh, Edge AI. Like right now, GitHub, if you think about it, every time you're typing one letter, that actually is doing an inference and it's sending right to the cloud what's, what's, you know, what you type, and then you get the inference back uh, of, you know, and just suggest a code. Um, and that right now is, is, is being done in the cloud when it comes to GitHub Copilot, but it's going to come back right all the way to the edge. So there are different kind of, you know, kind of buckets here of the edge. In our case, you know, we're working what we call this highly distributed edge, and we're working on this uh, specific kind of what we call um, utility inferencing. So basically, so these devices will be doing like small kind of inferencing. We're not talking about big models. We're talking about small models, right? And we're not talking about training on the edge, but actually just doing the inferencing on the edge. So what are, what are the kind of the challenges that we, we see on these kind of uh, you know, uh, edge computing uh, scenarios? So the first thing is about you know, resource constraints. So we're seeing that a lot of these kind of devices, the small devices, generally they don't have a GPU. 
Um, they just were talking about i5, you know, i3, 4 GB of RAM, you know, like really kind of, you know, when I talk about the big on-prem servers. The second thing is, this, this is a really heterogeneous environment. So when we talk with customers, we see customers that are using Windows, they're using Linux, they're using ARM32, ARM64, x64, now RISC V. So it's just this matrix is getting bigger and bigger. Um, also cost. So, you know, and when we talk about cost, you know, it's not only the cost of purchasing these devices, which maybe, you know, you, you have a fleet that has like 20,000 devices, but it's also actually also the cost of running your solution. So if you're running, for example, let's say an AI model and all these kind of 20,000 devices, if you're running a model that is energy efficient, that could actually have a big impact. The same right when you're doing right in your connectivity. If you're running, if you're downloading a container that actually was not optimized and maybe it's like 200, 300 MB, um, there's going to be a cost right in that kind of in that uh, connectivity and that bandwidth that you have. Um, so we, you know, like sometimes we were working with a lot of customers that they're running, for example, AJI right on, on ships, and then you know the, the connectivity that they have is really limited. Sometimes it's just satellite. Sometimes they're disconnected for like you know, a couple of months, and, and then you actually know, once they, buy, they reach a port, they just have a really limited connectivity. And then finally, security. When you're running an AI, kind of a, an AI workload uh, on a cloud, you actually know where that's running. That's running your know, specific data center. You know who, had, who has access to that data center. Then you have security on the hardware layer, the security on the software layer. But when you come to these edge AI kind of solutions, you know, this kind of device could be running on any kind of retail shop on top of a shelf there, and anyone can just go ahead there and connect, you know, like a USB device and inject the malware. So, you know, when you're trying to do this kind of solution, there's a lot of these challenges that you need to, you need to tackle. But when UI AI, it gets even worse, right? And, and, you know, what we've been talking with these customers that are you trying to get AI to the, to, the, to the edge, they need to tackle all these kind of um, challenges that we talked about, but now also they need to define, okay, what's gonna be the hardware acceleration that I wanna use? It's gonna be CPU, it's gonna be GPU, NPU, FFMPNG, right? It's, it feels like you know, every day there's something, there's new hardware that we need to support. Also, there are multiple frameworks. Um, so when you, sometimes when you talk about, you know, these models, you have, well, I'm, I'm using Keras, I'm using PyTorch, I'm using TensorFlow, OpenVINO, right? So there's so many kind of frameworks that, you know, these kind of our developers need to choose when they're doing this kind of edge AI solution. And finally, you have multiple models. So now with JustGPT, we'll know that's a 3.5, that's a JustGPT4. Uh, we have, you know, mid, you know, mid journey V1, V2, Llama, and even in, in Llama V2, you have the 7 billion, the 70 billion, the 30 billion. So, you know, the matrix that you actually need to kind of support, uh, it's, it's, it's really, really big. So over the past kind of few months, we've been working with Ralph's team in order to kind of, you know, use, develop these uh, kind of edge AI solutions and address most of these kind of uh, edge AI problems by using WebAssembly and Onyx. And we believe you know, we can tackle kind of these main edge AI problems because by using WebAssembly and Onyx, first of all, you can get a reduced footprint. So you, know, you can bring it down from maybe you had a 300 MB kind of container, now you bring it all the way down to a WebAssembly module that maybe is like two or three MB. At the same time, right, it's also better memory kind of usage. The second thing is just like, right, as we talk, this environment is really heterogeneous. We have ARM64, right, x64, Windows, Linux. Uh, so by, you, by using WebAssembly, you can actually get one unified kind of architecture and compilation. This promise of just like, you know, compile once and, you know, deploy everywhere, it kind of starts making sense when you're using WebAssembly. The third thing is around improved security, right? We all know that containers do have some kind of flaws uh, and you know, the WebAssembly kind of security posture is much better uh, you know, by having this kind of deny by default. Um, and we, you know, like we, we can get a much better kind of security approach when using WebAssembly. And finally, by using Onyx, you can get this uh, unified AI framework. So you know, Onyx is a kind of open, kind of open source standard. You know how you can compile these models. Um, so you could have different kind of uh, models. Let's say PyTorch, TensorFlow, and then you just have a unified pipeline where you convert the models from you know PyTorch or, or TensorFlow all the way to Onyx, and then you always just use right uh, WebAssembly plus Onyx in order to run your AI models. So what's the work that we've been doing? So the first thing was just like, let's go ahead and pick a model, 
and convert it to Onyx. So in our case, for this demo, we just use a really simple model. It's a squeeze net model uh, in order to do image classification. Although if you wanted it, you know, the whole tool chain is there, you can just get whatever, you know, let's say PyTorch or let's say JetGPT GPT model and just convert it to Onyx. That should be pretty fast forward. Um, the second thing was just that right now, uh, the Onyx runtime, it's only, it's, well, there's no Rust support for it, but there is a C kind of support for it. So there's an uh, open source library that's called Onyx Runtime-RS, which was a bit out outdated. So we updated that. It's fully now with the latest kind of uh, Onyx Runtime support. We already test that with Mac OS, with Ubuntu and Windows. It works. We're going to be upstreaming that in the next couple of weeks. After that, we had to actually bring the Onyx compatibility with WASDNN. Uh, so WASDNN had the backend implementation for OpenVINO, and I think it was from, from, uh, for PyTorch, but had no compatibility with, with Onyx. So we had to actually implement that uh, in order to you know, be able to run these Onyx models directly with WASI. And then the final thing was just that once, once we finished that, we actually needed to create, right, uh, this, uh, bring this compatibility to WASM time and, and run WASI. So we need to act, actually add our own kind of uh, Onyx WASI and N implementation to this uh, yeah, WASI, WASM time and run WASI versions, which also we have a PR open here, right, and we expect to be uh, upstreaming right in the next couple of weeks. So now let's, let's go ahead and do a really quick demo of what's the work that we've been doing. So I'll just go here. Um, so I'll start by just going over the process of what we did. So the first thing is just like going over a model. In our case, again, we were using uh, an Onyx model. Um, this is a really simple model. It's a squeeze net model. And if you go to you know, this, this kind of page, you can get all the documentation. Uh, you can just download from here. And you'll get you know, what's, what are the, the kind of steps that you need to do in order to run the model. In our case, it's just as an input, it's getting an image, right, which is 224 by 224. Pre-processing, we just need to do some there. Pre-processing there, just like to move from FP32 to actually write to uh, uh, kind of do the range of 0, 1 and doing the normalizing. And then as an output, right, what we get is, okay, what's the probability for each of these uh, 1,000 classes that ImageNet was uh, kind of trained for? And then finally, right, there's a post-processing also there, you know, to run a softmax. So this is just really simple. I can go ahead here, and this is our, our example. We can see that we have, this is the model, which is, a, you know, the squeeze net, 1.1-7 onyx, and we have the labels here. Um, but before, before going into kind of the demo that we have here, let's go a bit, go over our WASDNN implementation. So if we are, we're here right now, right, this is the WASDNN kind of, of WASM time implementation. We can go here to you know the, the mod, um, and we can we, we can see here that we now have right the Onyx backend right. So this is one of the things that we added, and here we have the Onyx kind of implementation. And basically, this implementation what it's doing is it's just implementing this kind of interface. The main kind of functions here, which are, you know the load function, which is actually loading the module. Um, we have the init execution context, which actually will execute kind of start this execution context and the graph execution context. And then finally, you know, maybe the most important one, which is the compute one. So this is what, what it's gonna do is actually get as an input. This is a, it's a, a byte vectors. That's how it, it is defined when you're using WASDNN. You know, the input is always a vector of bytes. Um, so here you can see, right, <clears throat> that we're, we're getting the, 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 um, the bytes. Then we, we transform that right from bytes to F, FP32 because right now our library, the Onyx runtime dash rs, is just using uh, F, F, uh, P32 kind of vectors. And then we go ahead, we, we execute it, the inferencing, and then finally the output of this, it's an FP32, so we need to convert it back right to uh, bytes so that we are kind of conformant with the, the WASDNN implementation. So now, Let's go ahead and check the example. Francisco. Yeah. So I don't have a mic on, but uh, remember what I just showed you about converting the FP32s back? Because we're going to end up talking about that at the end of the presentation. Yep. So one of the things that we did here, right, was actually we, had, we as part of kind of this implementation, we added an example of how you can run this at, you know, right now. So what we're going to do, be doing here is just doing really simple inferencing. So here I have a dog image, right? Um, 
so we'll go ahead and check our main here. So what, what I'm doing here is basically, first of all, I'll just define the path of you know, where I have the image. I'll go ahead and import you know, you know, all the width here, and specifically I'll, I'll import all the WASINN kind of um, modules that I need. So I you know, have the graph here, I have the inference kind of thing, and then you have the tensor with a different kind of tensor uh, um, definitions. So then the first thing that we need to do is actually load the model. So in our case, we'll just load it locally here. We have it right, this, this is under fixture model, you know, squeeze it one dot one. Um, once we have that model created, we'll create the, you know, the, the graph, the execution graph. You need the context here. Then we're gonna be loading the labels. So this is just the, the model was trained on 1,000 labels, so we're just gonna load that so then we can actually sh uh, show the final result of for each label, what's the probability. And, maybe, and here is one of you know, the most important part, which is actually we need to go ahead, grab the image, and prepare the WASINN tensor. So if you see here, right, we have this, this function that is called the image to tensor, and this is actually doing that conversion. So if you go here to actually the implementation of this, we can see that it's basically reading the image, then it's just cropping the image to a specific size, so this model needs a 224 by 224 kind of uh, image. Then we'll just grab the bytes. Uh, this is just an RGB kind of a matrix. Do the normalization of each pixel. And then finally just put it down right into a vector of bytes so that we can put that right as the input for WASINN. So once we have that, right, which is the data, we'll just say, hey, we're gonna be creating a WASINN tensor, which is gonna have these dimensions. It's gonna be of type FP32. And this is the data that we'll be using. We set, right, we set the input tensor, and then we just go ahead and run the inferencing. So you can see here we have the compute. This will actually execute the inferencing directly on the Onyx model. Once we get, you know, finish that, we'll retrieve the output. Again, the output is a, a vector of bytes. We need to migrate that while we transform that into FP, F32 bits, kind of a floating point. And as part of the post-processing, we need to actually apply the softmax layer because you know, that's not part of the model. So we'll just apply you know, a softmax layer and then finally we'll arrange the different you know, probabilities and print the final kind of uh, inferencing. So now let's go ahead and run it. So before running this, because we, we uh, was some time, you know, uh, right now the public version has no uh, kind of uh, Onyx support, we'll have to build was some time hours. So, so I'll just do it here. So I'm gonna just build WASM time with these specific features, right, with the component model and the WASINN. So there it is, I already have that compiled. Uh, I'm gonna head and also, now I'm gonna run, right, I'm gonna create my component of these kind of uh, examples. So if you see here, we're in WASINN, examples and this classification component Onyx. So I'm gonna go ahead and create that. There is there, and this is gonna create the, you know, the WebAssembly module. And then now I'm just gonna go ahead and run this. So how I'm gonna run it is, I'm gonna go use my own kind of WASM time uh, bits. I'm gonna say that I need the component model. Also I need as a module, I need the experimental WASM kind of implementation. Um, and then what I'm doing here is uh, actually I'm gonna, uh, you know, mapping one directory from my machine to actually inside the module so that I can get, you know, the, the, the images, the labels, and the uh, Onyx model. And then finally I'm just here, right, just running my WebAssembly module that I just created, right? So classification component dot onyx dot wasm. So I'll just run it here. And there it is, it's pretty fast, right? So you can see that it was reading the model, something like 45 MBs. Uh, it loaded the graph into WASINN. It actually created the WASINN execution. Uh, it executed the graph inference. Um, and then finally we get here, right, that this is a golden retriever with a 99% probability. So now I can just go ahead and do another example. I'll just go ahead and change the image. So let's say I have a panda here. I'll just change it. Just change the image, so really quick. I'll just recompile, right, the component with a new kind of Im image. And I can then just go ahead and run it again, but now with the panda image. And we get, right, okay, this is a panda bear. Um, with something else at 97% probability. Um, so that's kind of you know the demo where you know we're running you know WebAssembly uh, with you know with WASINN with an Onyx model 
uh, doing, you know, like what we call utility inferencing for these kind of edge scenarios. And now Rolf is going to talk a bit about, you know, what's next. You know, this is work that we started, but now, we, you know, we're, we're working on things for the next couple of months. So. Right. So uh, if you can hear me, I, apparently I did a little feedback in front of the speaker. Forgive me. So uh, when we get, talk about what's next, I, first I want to reset some of the context. So like WASI NN, for those of people, people who don't know, is a proposal uh, for a uh, WASI uh, uh, interface, a component interface. Uh, that it would be standard in the component model for things like uh, models. Uh, the original implementations, as Francisco said, were things like TensorFlow. I think originally it was... Um, TensorFlow and uh, OpenVINO. OpenVINO, that's right. And so that, that's really good, but we wanted a generic um, uh, model, generic kind of approach and implementation as well. wasi -NN is fine, but so one of the aspects of wasi -NN being open source means it's a proposal means that anybody in the component, uh, in, if this is interesting to you, you can actually go and participate in the evolution of that proposal. Um, it's the experience that we had here, we're gonna talk about a couple of variants that are clearly going to be part of the evolution of wasi -NN. Um, By the way, Onyx and wasi -NN, all of this stuff is open source, uh, pretty much runs everywhere, and so that's the really critical part of what we're, what we're doing here. And uh, as uh, Francisco mentioned, this is also going to be supported in um, the RunWASI and Kubernetes shims, where you can run essentially everything in Kubernetes, no matter whether it's a, you know, an edge Kubernetes like K3Ds or something like that, or whether it's um, a large cluster and you want to really use some big engines on it, for example. And that's all open source in the RunWASI uh, repository of the ContainerD project and the CNCF. So all of this stuff is open source. Um, however, there, is a, there are two things. Now, Francisco mentioned a couple of things. One is the sort of the size of the models. Now, the way the interface is defined, um, you load the model into the module, you pass the model into the API, and if the model is quite large, you can imagine that's going to really slow things down. So if you're interested in size, you're in a constrained space, or if your networking is not really that great, regardless of the uh, resource uh, space that you have, you know, passing a 40, 50 megabyte model is going to take some time, uh, and it's not time that you want. You can't pass it on every, every invocation, for example, and you don't want to actually put it in the WebAssembly because now your WebAssembly is essentially pretty substantial and you run into the same capacity problems. So for larger models, it's possible that the interface for wasi -NN isn't really the final approach. Uh, in the repository in the proposal, uh, you might want, if you're interested in larger, larger models, you might want to look at something uh, that in the issue queue is called um, uh, named models. Um, that was not my fault, whatever it was. Um, and that's the idea that you can actually have essentially side-loaded some big models uh, or in a cache or something like that next to, sitting next to the model edu execution, uh, module execution environment and merely refer to that. And in other words, the model, the larger model is already loaded and you're using only the module for the compute of, of the inferencing, for example. So that's one area where either the wasi -NN API might be expanded uh, or evolve. And so if you have uh, opinions about that, love to have you upstream and, uh, to help us out thinking about how that might, might work. Um, or it's possible that there's another proposal for large models. Because if you think about it, Smaller models for the kind of inferencing that Francisco was showing here are super useful for inventory things or factory uh, sensors. He was mentioning things like looking at seams for welding, make sure, making sure those are okay. Um, we even had a, a, an Azure space. There was a situation where um, one of the things that the astronauts do is they examine gloves for faults every time they come in from a spacewalk. And that's actually prone to human error. So they want to use that uh, this kind of inferencing to examine gloves automatically uh, and to get a lower error rate for re reuse of those gloves, right, and so forth. So they, they, these kinds of inferencing comes up quite a bit. Um, so we think of those smaller models as, and focus models as very utility related. So you think of that as the 80% case. When you get to the larger models, you have a bigger, a bigger panoply of targets and you almost always need. The other thing, you may want hardware support you probably do want hardware support, especially for a bigger model. So things like GPUs and other kinds of customized chips are going to be really, really important for those kinds of models. And now the question of how do you detect 
a particular GPU and lean into that optimization becomes part of your question. So for things like big models, and for hardware optimizations that are required for your scenario, it's possible that Wazi NN needs some evolution or we're looking at a different approach uh, or a different proposal. So that doesn't mean that Wazi NN is unsuccessful. So far, it's been really successful. But another example of an evolution we already know is going to happen because we've been talking with the community and we sort of, turns out everybody is sort of thinking about, is that FP32 that I mentioned, right? Um, having to convert the model into a vector of FP32s and then convert it back after you've done the compute is pure waste, right? It's pure, pure computing waste. And so one of the evolutions clearly going to happen in Wazi NN working with everybody up there is that there's going to have to be some um, elaboration of the, of the API proposal to take in uh, larger, uh, more complex types to pass those kinds of things so that they don't actually have to be converted merely to do the work that we'd hope to do. So that's another example of the future, though. So one, a, couple of, a couple of other things we want to do, go ahead and click that, because I wanted to call out a couple of people here. Um, for the WASM time implementation, that'll be submitted upstream in a PR to WASM time so that people can use WASM time. We obviously hope to participate with other runtimes and get that uh, adopted as a proposal so that people can use it anywhere. It's super useful, right? And then also uh, the uh, WASI NN implementation will be, uh, will be uh, proposed if it isn't, I don't know if it's already proposed. Have we already put PR in? Oh, yeah, we'll put the PR in. So the, the gentleman over there, David Justice, whose name is up there, uh, he can nod or raise his hand. If you want it immediately in the proposal, go yell at him to submit the PR, because that's our intention um, as part of the evolution. And this is all part of the component model. So we're really looking forward to preview two. Um, that's something that we think is really, really important. But in addition to calling out David to embarrass him, I also want to thank him. And um, Joe, specifically, for their work trying to update the, the component model definition, get the new runtime compiling to it, recompile WASM time, and get the PRs ready for upstreaming. So I want to thank them. But I also want to call out uh, Radu Matai, who used to be uh, on the Microsoft team and is part of the new Fermion uh, team. He's here at the conference. He's out there. He originally compiled Onyx to the uh, Wazi NN about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, and his code was so good, which is great, that David and Joe and everybody were able to just pick it up and update it and get it running really, really fast. So I want to call out Radu's earlier work that we're building on here. So thanks to everybody, including you two. Um, so that's about it. Do we have yeah. another slide? Nope. Are there that's any it. other questions? Thank you very much. All right, I don't know if we have a mic. Do we have a mic? Doesn't matter. I will repeat the question. Go ahead. So this, um, this new interface, you can use it either to run the model as part of the host or as part of the runtime, or you could run the model as part of another representing component. Yes. So um, this is interesting. It's actually going to be a big, um, how shall I say it? It's going to be an experiential uh, thing as we roll forward with components in WebAssembly. And the reason is because WebAssembly has certain constraints. Uh, we'll call them constraints, but they can also be spun as benefits, depending on what you're doing, um, with respect to the kind of performance you're going to get. Because for example, you don't have a really robust threading model there, and async, and things like this. And that means that for scale-out computing that you normally think of as a server process, something pretty heavy, that can make use of a lot of async work and pool things and stuff like that, that's how you get throughput in a container workload or a regular workload, right? In WASI right now, that's a little bit difficult. So only when we get those threading and async will we be able to sit there and go, hey, I could take this big model and really burn some you know, threads on it inside the module as well as outside. Well, what that means is right now, you're going to burn. You're going to do the computing work for the implementation in the runtime. So that's why we're compiling here to Wasm time, or Whammer, or whatever your runtime might be. That's where most of your heavy host implementation is going to be, and the guest is going to route that that to that to the implementation in the, in the runtime for now. 
As we go forward, though, once you get the ability to have you know, all the async power, the threading, the networking that you might need in a web assembly, you'll begin testing for those environments where um, you're not highly centralized. So specifically, when you're talking about distributed edge, you're not necessarily going to have high-powered machines. And so it's probably easier and maybe better in some circumstances actually ship all the stuff in a module. And you'll get the kind of performance you need for the kind of utility, the small model um, work. Inside the module itself, you can ship the whole thing in the module. That will make sense in certain environments. But then, in, even in that case, if you're thinking about a centrally hosted service, right, where like a CDN service or like, for example, I work in Azure, so let's say we have a Microsoft Azure Onyx service, which we're not gonna have. But, but the point is, if we did, um, that kind of centralized service would be trying to target and support the whole world. For that kind of optimization, you'd almost always not run it in a module. You would actually have a custom built implementation in the, in the runtime part of thing. And all of these scenarios are merely different use cases. Uh, but if that answers your question, that's how I see it right now. Yeah. Um, so the answer the question is, will this make it possible to actually run models without knowing whether you have hardware acceleration? Actually, yes, it's possible. Um, again, you get into one of those uh, utility versus optimization scenarios. So uh, in small uh, cases with big modules where you know you have a specific chip, because of the resource constraints or because of the size of the model, you may actually be required to optimize on a particular piece of hardware because you know it's there. And so that's a case where you're not talking about utility inferencing, you're talking about something that you really need to dive into the hardware. However, in most cases, say for example, Francisco is referring to cases where you don't really know all the hardware you got and stuff like this. Sometimes there's gonna be a GPU, sometimes they're not. Right? You really are going to want a generic model that actually can pick up the GPU and use it if it's there. And so you are going to see implementations. Uh, Radu's original implementation for us actually checked to see if it had GPU support. And if it did, it used it. And if it didn't, it just did CPU inferencing. Right? And so that's po entirely possible. So the answer is yes, you can do that. And again, the choices you make, whether you do everything agnostic in an agnostic fashion or whether you lean into your optimizations for hardware, for size, and things like that, are going to be dependent on the scenario you're trying to address. That makes sense? Any other questions? Obviously, we'll hang out. So if you have questions you'd like to ask us afterward, feel free to come on up. Thank yep. you very much. Thank Appreciate you so much. It.